There's a thing called the monster group, which is a beautiful, very large, symmetrical thing. <laughs> We're going to have a look at what's called the monster group. That's a cool name, isn't it? That's a really, really cool name, yeah. There's never been any kind of explanation of why it's there. And it's obviously not there just by coincidence. Okay, so groups are uh, algebraic structures that arise naturally in the study of symmetry. Now that can be symmetry in a sort of a vast range of different contexts. Let's take a geometric, familiar sort of geometric shapes. Let's take um, an equilateral triangle. Okay, and let's label the vertices one, two, and three. I want to consider the symmetries of an equilateral triangle. So what, what I'm really thinking about here are rotations and reflections. Okay, so these are natural symmetries of this triangle. For example, we can consider certain rotations about that center point. Okay, now let's, let's write down this, these collections of symmetries. Let's call this collection G. If I sort of think of putting a pin in the paper, at that center point and then moving the triangle around. Well, I can rotate through certain angles and the triangle will move back onto itself. Okay, I have to be careful which angle I choose here, but sort of it's not too difficult to see that I could say rotate through 120 degrees. Let's write that R120. That would have the effect of permuting those vertices, the corners of the triangle. And I could also go through, say, 240 degrees. And they're really the only two non trivial rotations that I can do which will move that triangle back onto itself. Because 360 doesn't count. Well, 360 does count, actually, and that's really an important one. So let's actually include that one. We're going to need that to get this idea of a group. So let's call that R0. That means do nothing. OK, so that's the do nothing symmetry. That's really, really important in the concept of a group. OK, so we've got our rotations. Now, what else have we got? Let's consider sort of mirror symmetry. OK, so we could think about putting a mirror down that line, and that would also give us a symmetry of the, of the triangle. OK, it would fix the top vertex, and it would swap these two bottom corners. OK, so let's call that A. So let's include that over here. And then similarly, we have B and C. OK, so we've got three lines of reflectional symmetry of this triangle as well. OK, so A, B and C. So what we've written down here, these are, it's not too difficult to check that this is, this is a complete set of symmetries of the equilateral triangle. We've got six of them in total. So this is what's called the symmetry group of the equilateral triangle. The key concept with a group is it's more than just a collection of symmetries. There's a rule or there's an operation which allows us to combine two symmetries together. So if we take two symmetries, we could, we could take the first one and combine it with the second, and that will give us a third symmetry of the triangle. How does that work? Okay, let me give you an example. So let's say, consider, let, let's draw this triangle out again a little bit smaller. So we've got our one, two, three. Okay, let's actually see what happens to the vertices when we apply these symmetries. So let's say, apply, um, let's do um, A, okay. Okay, so A, we defined it to be this reflection in this vertical line of symmetry here. So what does that do to the, do to the vertices? Well, it swaps the bottom two. Okay, so it looks like that. That's what, would, that's what it would look like after we've applied that reflectional symmetry. And let's do another one. Let's now follow that up with, say, our anti-clockwise rotation through 120 degrees. Okay, now what does that give us? Okay, so what does that mean? So this becomes two, this is one, and this is three. OK, so that's what we've got. Now, we could have gone straight from the initial triangle to this end triangle with just one operation. What would that operation be? Well, what have we done here? We've fixed the bottom right vertex 3 and we've swapped these two. Well, that corresponds to what we call C. OK, that's that reflection, so we've got C. OK, so what we could do, we could write that down sort of mathematically. R120 composed with A equals C. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to define a sort of like a multiplication on this set. OK, so it's like, a, like a, some sort of natural operation which allows us to combine these two symmetries together and get another one. And that's, really, that's really what's going on. And that's really the key idea of a group. It's a collection of objects with some operation defined on it which satisfies these sort of properties. This, is, allows, us you to, this allows us to define an abstract notion of a group. So this object here, this is the set. This is the collection of symmetries. OK, now the group, strictly speaking, is this collection of symmetries together with this rule for combining symmetries together. We can perhaps try and understand groups by breaking them up into smaller pieces. The analogy to keep in mind here is the idea of factorizing a positive number into prime factors. Okay, so this should be familiar to everybody. Okay, now we can do something like that for a group. It's a little bit more subtle, it's a little bit more complicated. Let's say 60 is 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. And those numbers I just said were all prime numbers. In group theory, there's a a sort of similar sounding theorem that every group is composed of a number of prime groups, except the term is simple groups. They're not actually terribly simple. Let's just consider, let me call R here. 
let's just consider the rotations. Okay, so let's forget about the reflections for a second. Okay, now, as I said, you can talk about that you have this notion of an abstract group. Now, R itself is actually a group. Okay, it's not the symmetry group of the equilateral triangle, it's the rotational, it's the group of rotational symmetries of the equilateral triangle. It's like a subset. It's like a subset, but it's what we call a subgroup. Now, you see, it's not just any old subset. The key property is that, it, first of all, it has the do nothing element. That's really important. And the other key property we're looking for here is that it's, this set is closed under this operation that we defined. In other words, if I take two rotations in here and combine them, then I get another element of that particular set. I can't combine two rotations together and then suddenly get a reflection. That's not going to happen. We can easily check that. OK, so that's the key property that this is actually a subgroup. OK, so that's R. Let's define S to take, okay, so we're going to have R0 in there. We're going to need R0 in any of our, in any of our subgroups. That's this key do nothing element. And let's just take A. Now this has got three elements and this has got two elements. And again, this set S is a subgroup because if you do, if you compose A with itself, that's a reflection done twice, but that gets you R0. That's the do nothing, that's the do nothing operation. So to be a subgroup, it always has to leave you a method to get back home. Yeah, that's right. So it must be, yeah, that's right. So I mean, it must contain the do nothing element and it must have the property that if I take any two elements in that smaller subset, if I combine them, then I stay inside that set. That's the key thing we're looking for here. It's not too hard to see that we actually can write G as R times S as a sort of a factorization. What this means is, what I've, what I've written down here is that every element of this, of this symmetry group G is a product of something in R with something in S. Okay, so that's why we might say that this is a factorization of G into two smaller pieces. Okay, so these things are what are called simple groups. So the idea would be then to try and understand all groups, or in other words, to try and understand all possible types of symmetry. Can we give a complete description of what all these basic building blocks, all these atoms of symmetry, what they actually look like? Okay, so this has been sort of a, a, a fundamental problem in group theory and in algebra for more than 100 years. What's remarkable is that it is actually possible to do this. Okay, so there's, this, there's a theorem called the classification of finite simple groups, which was announced around 1980, which provides us with this sort of periodic table of symmetry. I can see it behind you. That's right, it's up on the wall there, that's right. Okay, so what, what is this theorem then? So, it, so it's, um, it's this inc incredible, amazing result that describes what all the finite simple groups look like. So this is a really um, very unique theorem in all of mathematics. I mean, it was a huge uh, international collaborative effort to prove this theorem over many, many decades. Its proof runs to between 10,000 and 100,000 pages. And it was done by three or four hundred mathematicians. I don't think anybody's read through the whole proof. <laughs> it's sort of a, an incredible, incredible achievement, really. Certainly one of the highlights of 20th century mathematics. There were some mistakes in it. In anything as long as that, there are bound to be some mistakes. So it's not terribly worrying that there are some mistakes in it. What we're looking to do is we're just trying to sort of identify various families of simple groups. So for example, one family will be all of the groups which have size of prime number. Okay, now we don't know what all the primes look like, of course there's infinitely many of them, but, but we can give a descriptive definition of, of, of this particular family. And it turns out there's various other infinite families of simple groups, which are a little more difficult to, de to, de to define, so I won't do that here. But there's various other infinite families that arise, they don't all have to have size of prime number. Okay, so it's a little bit more complicated than the, sort of the factorization of integers. What's, what's, what's really interesting about this theorem is that we have these various infinite families that come up, but there are some exceptions. Okay, so the, there's, it turns out, sort of remarkable fact, that there are 20, exactly 26 finite simple groups which do not belong to any of these infinite families. They're like, like black sheep. They're like black sheep, yeah. They, 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 they refuse to belong to any of these, any of these sort of well-known, well-behaved uh, groups. There were 26 of them. Exactly 26 of them, yeah. So these are what are called the sporadic simple groups. Okay, so now they have a long, long history. So the first five of them were discovered in the 1860s, 1870s. Um, and then the sixth one wasn't discovered until about 100 years later, in the 1960s. And then over the subsequent 10, 15 years, a further 20 of these sporadic groups were discovered. And this all came out of this intensive effort going into the proof of the classification theory in this enormous, enormous project. The result is probably true, and I don't understand it. That's uh, uh, absolutely amazing, incredible. It's not incredible that I don't understand it. I mean, uh, it, it's the, the fact that the theorem is true, and apparently, and it's uh, 
we don't know why it's true. And this is where the monster comes in because the monster group is the largest of these um, sporadic simple groups. Largest, what do you mean by largest, has the most members of? Yeah, that's right. So as you say, a group is a collection of symmetries or collection of elements with respect to some operation. And largest just means, yeah, in terms of the number of, the number of members of this, of this particular uh, group. So the monster is, it's not unique. It's just the biggest of this, of a little group of outliers. Well, yeah, I mean, it's unique in, it's unique in the sense that there's only one, there's only one monster. Okay, if you can say it that way. There's only one monster, but it's, it's a unique defining property it might be to say that it's a simple group, which is one of these 26 sporadics, and it has by far the largest order. So it's sort of like the big daddy of all these sporadic groups. And in fact, quite a few of the other 26 sporadic, the other 25 sporadics, sort of live inside the monster in some sense. Not all of them do, but, but many of them can be found in some way inside the monster. So it's like a bit of like a, bit of like a mother group for these sporadic simple groups. How, how big are we talking here? We're talking absolutely enormous. Actually, so let me let me see if I can write this down. So what are we looking at? So, so we use um, m to denote the monster. Okay, and this denotes the size. Okay, and what is this thing? So, okay, let's write it out in full in full detail. Okay, so it's a big number. So I hope we've got a bit of time for this. Six, four, five, nine, seven. I'm going to run out of space. Let me continue down here. Still coming on. So five, seven, zero. Eight, and then I okay, go nine zeros on the end. So this is approximately uh, eight times ten to the fifty-three. Okay, that's the size of the monster. That's how many symmetries it contains. That's right. So I mean, we we sort of talked about a group as being sort of the um, the symmetry group of some object. So the monster can be defined in this way as well. It is the symmetry group of some structure. So at the start of our little talk. You showed me an equilateral triangle, yeah. and we looked at its symmetries. Right. What does the object for which the monster group represents symmetries look okay. like? Okay, well, this is pretty difficult. This is pretty difficult. It's quite a, quite a difficult thing to try and explain. I think of them as Christmas tree ornaments. Um, you can hang, you know, sometimes you see a Christmas tree ornament which has a number of spikes coming out of it and is covered all over with silvery paint or paper or something and it turns around and then from some points of view you see it has five-fold symmetry and then oh, it's, oh look it's three-fold symmetry right now and so on. It is the symmetry group of some um, structure. It's not as simple as an equilateral triangle. We can't draw it on a piece of paper unfortunately. We can't even think about it in three-dimensional space. So it turns out the initial construct, the, 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 the construction of the monster um, relies on the existence of some mathematical structure in high-dimensional space and, this, and the monster is the symmetry group of this object. Now the number of dimensions we're talking about here is 196,883. So this is a very, very difficult thing to try and, try and picture in our minds. Why 196,883? That's just the way it is. Like I know that's a lot of dimensions, but it seems arbitrarily small at the same time. It seems strange that there's this, this cut-off number and there's nothing else above it. Like it just, it seems such an exact number. Yeah, I mean, this is the business with sporadic groups. I mean, this is why they're so fascinating. I mean, why are there only 26 of them? Why not 27? Why not 28? Do they belong? Can we sort of fit them into some other infinite family of groups? But it's, um, it's a sort of a bit of a mystery that, this is, that these are the numbers that, that, that come out of this, um, of this classification theorem. It's a famous thing, yeah, for sure. I mean, the monster group, I mean, simple groups being these basic building blocks of, of symmetry. I mean, the, these, are, these are sort of at the center of study in, in, in group theory. And so the monster plays a central role in that because of its starring role as the largest of these sporadics. Sometimes I think of these things as not like Christmas tree ornaments, but like gems. Most people like jewellery, <laughs> uh, you know, because the light sparkles and uh, somehow there's a slight prism effect so that you may see, you know, even if it's illuminated with white light, you may see reds and greens and blues and so on. Uh, they look nice. Uh, well, so do these things in higher dimensional space, except that I haven't got 186,883 dimensional eyes, so I'll never see them. But the actual study of the monster group is quite a niche subject. I mean, people, there are, there are a small group of people who have really dedicated uh, their careers to really understanding and probing the structure of this group. And so a lot, a lot is known about the monster, we know a lot about its internal structure. 
um, about its subgroups like we saw here in the subgroups of, of this symmetry group of the equilateral triangle. We do know quite a lot about it, but there's still a lot of things to be, um, to be fully understood. It's a difficult, it's a very, due to its size, it's, um, it's a very difficult group to work with. I would just like to know what it's all about. Uh, you know, why it's there. Uh, and every now and then, I, I've often said, I've said for 25 or 30 years, that the one thing I'd really like to know before I die is why the monster group exists. You have the monster here, then the, the second largest one's called the baby monster. Who discovered the monster? Not someone called Monster. No, not someone called Monster, actually, no. So, that's, so the baby monster and the monster are the only ones, I think, which uh, don't have that, have that property. You haven't got the hope, but probably you don't care either. I care. Um, I, I'd like to understand what the hell's going on. If you forgive me for expressing it like that.